Art of Time Ensemble presents Dance to the Abyss at Harborfront Center Theater, February 23rd to the 25th. Step back in time to the 1920s and immerse yourself in the decadent world of the Weimar Republic. Join us for a night of cabaret and jazz-inspired songs as we explore the music that once defined an era on the brink of catastrophe, featuring the work of Jewish composers Erwin Schulhoff, Misha Spolansky, and musicians Wallace Holiday, Kevin Turcott, Andrew Barashko, Drew Gerard, and more. Tickets on sale now at harborfrontcenter.com. Use promo code CABARET25 to receive 25% off your tickets. This is Bonjour Chai, the Rabbinical School Dropouts Edition. I'm Avi Feingold. I'm here with Phoebe maltz and Zach Kaufman behind the boards. We are your Frozen Chosen. On today's show, we talk about rabbis, Jewish leadership, Jewish followership. We talk about a whole host of articles that are examining the thriving of the Jewish population while the decline in rabbinical schools is happening. Are they coexisting? Are they a contradiction in terms? All of this and more coming up right after this. Phoebe, Zach... How's it going? We are well. We're doing good. Okay. There was an article by Gabby Deutsch entitled, At Conservative and Reform Rabbinical Schools, A Debate Over Red Lines on Anti-Zionism. This was in Jewish Insider. Um, the idea that uh, rabbinical schools are grappling with the idea of anti-Zionism and how they should deal with it amongst their students. What's allowed? What's not allowed? Is this about thought police? Is this not about thought police? What I took from this is that there's a pattern that you see in other fields, like in academia and journalism and so forth, where where young people in a in highly educated settings tend to be to the left politically, not just of most people, but even of like most mainstream liberals. So they are sort of more social justice oriented, more um, activist oriented, and that this has been the case for a number of years. That's this broader pattern in society also exists in perhaps unexpectedly, you know, in the rabbinical realm where it's playing out in a more specific way to do with Israel and politics to do with Israel. So what you have is you have a group of younger people who um, want to be rabbis who are coming up against um, sort of leaders at their rabbinical schools, but also possibly, although possibly not, congregants at their perhaps one day future congregations who feel that um, being anti-Israel is a problem. So yeah, so I mean, for me, the, the aspects that were interesting, well, one was just, um, who who is a rabbi? This obvious, simple question for you. But I guess like I'm thinking just there are different denominations, right? So well, this article was in particular about like people who graduate from institutions that give them the professional label, or not professional even, but uh, professional and religious label of rabbi. So you could call yourself a rabbi, but this in particular was talking about institutions that issue some sort of professional designation. Right, right. But there are different, like, would you have a Chabad rabbi and like a reform rabbi going to the same rabbinical school together? No. I right. mean, so that's what I'm getting not likely. at. That's there are right. more that's denomin- what I'm, okay. There are more schools that are becoming like that are calling themselves denomination free. So the school we spoke about a few weeks ago, Hebrew College, where with where Art Green was um, previously associated with defenestrated, defenestrated. Sure. Um, I was going a lot more neutral with that one. Like they are non-denominational right. rabbinical schools. But previously and historically, there was always it was denominational. The idea was you went to a school because you you proved of that schools or that rabbi or that approach uh, to things. And you said, this is what I like. This is what I want to be part of. Therefore, I am going to go and learn from this school. Uh, apart from the Israel topic, do they tell students when they're coming in, um, you have to adhere to these ideologies? Like you, if you're going to come to the Jewish Theological Seminary, you have to believe in God, you have to believe in the coming of the Messiah, you have to believe in the Bible is literal. Like, are there expectations that you're going to have certain ideologies, and do they make them explicit? It's actually related to what I just said, which is 
there were never really purity tests going into rabbinical schools because the assumption was if you came into this school, you sort of understood what the school's values were and you believed in them and that you were going along those lines. But we're starting to see that shift away from it because there are so many people that you know, have different views and the diversity of views are there and the schools are struggling to deal with what to do with various people who may have different beliefs. So a good example, even though it's a bit more extreme, in the Orthodox world, it would be a no-brainer until fairly recently that you wouldn't have necessarily out gay students. But then you have places like Yeshiva Chovavei Torah, which is a modern yet orthodox school. We're not going to get into what the denomination, the, the denominational fragments are, um, but has been dealing with this over the past few years. Can you have an out gay student? It, do, they, do you have to make them say that they have to stay celibate? Right, because that's we don't want them to be practicing homosexuals. They can fall out of practice. Hate the sin, not the sinner. Exactly, stuff like that. And they've been dealing with it. And sometimes to to not great, like they had a student that basically they had to kick out of the school three months before he graduated because he got engaged to another man and very publicly. And they didn't want to do it. And it's been bad PR for everybody all along. But they, they're now dealing with the fact that they have graduates that are willing to do um, to perform gay weddings in an Orthodox setting, and they don't necessarily approve of that. In the conservative movement, um, for decades, there have been individuals who have ordination from the conservative movement who were doing intermarriages. Um, If you came into JTS saying, I'm going to perform intermarriages, they probably wouldn't accept you anymore. They'd probably kick you out. From a historical perspective, like these places didn't always exist before we had these ideas of there are uh, Jewish denominations and uh, whatever. Wasn't how we handed out how we called people rabbis sort of different. You know, it was much more individual. Look, the, the, the way that I became a rabbi was a lot more in the historical approach. It was a group of eight guys that decided to, they wanted to learn with a specific rabbi because we appreciated his approach to Judaism and to life and to his learning. And we said, we want to learn with you. We want to learn for ordination. And we did. And we graduated and we became rabbis. But the fact is that it was always this, you know, Uh, teacher to student, teacher to student, teacher to student. There were always schools. There were rabbinical schools that have been around for many centuries. Um, But the thing that's more important is that ordination was really a legal um, degree, right? It was an idea that you studied certain sections of Jewish law, you have fluency in them, and you're able to answer questions about kosher, about Shabbat, about um, nida, like ritual purity and stuff like that. Like, I That's what it was. And nowadays, the rabbinical schools have exploded in terms of their pastoral training, their um, their homiletics, their idea that like they are training people to be leaders and not just to say, here is your legal degree that says that you can answer questions about these specific topics. The the article about the rabbinical schools, it it took as like the thesis, the sort of uh, axiom the reason why there's so much pressure on rabbinical schools to articulate um, a vision is that there's so few people who want to go to rabbinical school. There's um, a, a very limited pool right now. And when a, if you make a statement anyway, you might lose out on some potential um, applicants or you'll lose out on some people and as the pool gets smaller and smaller, that these institutions don't know how to uh, not lose applicants and articulate a galvanizing, you know, ideology. Are there not enough rabbis or are there, you know, are are we not making the rabbinate interesting enough that people want to go and do it? I think that it's it's, 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 it's a problem in the other direction that we're basically not reminding people that Jew, Jewish, Jewish leadership isn't necessarily in the pulpit, but that Jewish leadership should entail some serious Jewish learning to be able to go to it. Okay, so Avi, I, can I jump in on that front? Um, because I feel like there are a few pieces here that I'm having, I'm struggling to kind of put together. So there are the increasingly progressive, including on Israel, 20-something students. Mm-hmm. There are the leadership at a rabbinical school, um, you know, who are saying, no, no, this is not what we want. Then there's the question of, for lack of a better term, normie Jews, Jews in a congregation. And I think that the question where I think maybe, maybe I, I don't know if I'm disagreeing or just trying to make sense of it, is it really true that in a mainstream Jewish congregation, there are a ton of anti-Zionists? Now, 
people with certain specific criticisms of Israel, sure. But is that a commonplace enough view that there would be a an affirmative reason why you would want there to be rabbis who are espousing that view? I think that what we're conflating here is, one, do people within the Jewish community hold these opinions? And two, should rabbis hold these opinions? And should we be graduating rabbis with these types of opinions? Right? And that those are two separate issues. It's clear to me that there is a plurality of Jews who are normies, who are just around, not necessarily in synagogues, because as we keep establishing, synagogues are not the central place where Jews are anymore. There's a lot of Jews who are not in synagogues, who are involved, um, ha- who have a complicated view, who have a complex and nuanced view of what Zionism means to them. So that is clear, right? Um, If as a result of that, there are younger Jews or there are Jews in general that from that group that want to go and become rabbis, should we be allowing them into the rabbinical schools? Should we be graduating them? I think that's for every rabbinical school to decide and to say, this is our position on what Zionism is. And if you don't agree with it, you should find another rabbinical school. And that's fine, right? So you are for saying, like, we should have, they should articulate a strong vision. And because I think rabbinical schools are about teaching somebody, right, not just how to think, but this is our opinions. We are basically sending out representatives into the world of what we believe. This idea that, like, I, I'm actually not necessarily for these non-denominational, open-ended rabbinical schools that basically say, we're going to teach you a little bit about how to be a good leader. We're going to teach you a little bit of Torah. We're going to teach you a little bit about how how to, you know, play the guitar and be a camp person, all of these like little bits of everything. I want people to graduate from a rabbinate with a rabbinical degree with some very specific ways of doing things, not necessarily to um, deny the validity of other people's positions, right? But to go and say, right, this is a school of thought. I agree with, I disagree with other schools of thought, but I respect them, right? If you go back to the Mishnah, you go back to the Talmud, you have many, many different schools of thought that disagreed with each other, but that worked alongside each other. And then that's fine. Sorry, I just have a big picture kind of question here, which is the dangers of, or I don't know if dangerous even the way to put it, but like, it seems as if what could happen for Judaism is similar to what has happened in academia, where like, there's this flourishing of this very sort of this super lefty world that thrives in its own bubble. And then there's everybody else who's kind of doing their own thing. And that this has with academia, certainly, and with media led to a divide, right? Where like of comprehension, you know, like there is the the world that doesn't understand regular people in academia or media. This is a common accusation. This is the whole like, how where did Trump come from? This, you know, do you see what I'm saying at all? Mm-hmm. So I'm saying that I feel like I don't know whether, like, it seems like there would have to be a balance where if the role of, you wouldn't want Jewish religious leadership to also be a sector that's just completely, that has its righteous views that may be correct, whatever or not, that's, that's, I'm not weighing in on, but I'm saying if it's completely dislodged from... I, I get what you're saying, and I agree yeah, with it, but what yeah. we're seeing within the Jewish communal world, or at least what I'm seeing and I'm trying to argue for here, is that we're seeing the exact opposite, right? Instead of I in see. the academic world, everybody is basically as progressive as you can possibly be without saying, hey, let's hold up a second. You're not allowed to have that opinion, right? In the Jewish communal world, what we're seeing is basically the like everybody saying, unless you have full-throated support of Israel, you have no business being a Jewish leader, and we don't even want to necessarily talk about you as a congregant or as a member of the, of the community, and that that's just as dangerous. That feels mm-hmm. reductive to me and not necessarily true. I think that there is a big population of both synagogues, Jewish institutions, rabbinical schools, that if they have their druthers, they would, don't want to talk about this at all because they don't want to alienate people. Everyone wants them to take a stand, and none of them want to take a stand because when you take a stand, that means that uh, it's going to piss some people off. And they feel this deep sense of scarcity, either we don't have congregants, we don't have applicants, 
you know, if we take some sort of stand, we're going to lose people and we can't afford to lose people. But uh, faith is always about taking a stand, right? Th- this belief system and is basically saying, this is what I do. This is what I don't do. And I think the reason why they, they're afraid to alienate is because there's so few people that you're fighting for. You want to have as big a tent as possible. And I'm saying you can have red lines for yourself personally without saying that I'm going to alienate anybody else. I can go and say that I don't like what this synagogue is doing, but that doesn't mean that I don't want them as part of my larger community. So is something going to happen, though, where, I mean, I know we've talked a bit on the show in the past about, like, Israel or Zionism or whatever, fighting anti-Semitism as the new religion for some Jews. Is there going to be some kind of split where there are the Jews for whom Judaism is the religion, who are kind of either anti-Zionist or just non-Zionist and opting out of these conversations. And then on the other hand, there's some sort of like, <laughs> for lack of a better term, Jubilong Judaism. That's like, well, are these, is this going to be a rift where there's just like the sort of, or is it already, well, there, is that already I think in place? Historically, historically, there is, like I went to, for most of my life, I went to Camp Ramah, which was a religious camp. But for a summer, I was a counselor at this Zionist camp where for Shabbat, we went to the flat. We went to the flagpole and raised the Israeli flag and did kibbutz dancing. And we learned about Jewish history, and it was very Jewish. But it was in the mold of these sort of old school socialist mm-hmm. uh, Zionist. Yeah, I mean, I would even say that today it seems like it's becoming almost unlinked from any actual Israeli culture or having to do with anything that's actually happening in Israel. And it's like. And it's not even recognizable to Israelis, you know what I mean? It's having anything to do with Israel. It's, you know, I, does yeah, that, I, yeah, I remember I did this story when I was working at Israel Story about um, songs that a lot of Jewish campers learn at Jewish summer camp. But we're like, isn't this like modern Israeli culture? And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it actually like... Right, but at least it was with. at one point trying to be, even if yeah. it's... yeah. I actually hope that that is the case. I hope that there will be a schism, but that we'll be able to get along with each other. I don't know how, because I think that we don't get along with each other anyways. Um, I actually, and this is speaking as a Zionist, I hope that there are people who don't share my view. I think that that is the strength of Judaism, is that we get along with people who we don't um, agree with, and that that actually refines our position and creates nuance. Right now, there is no nuance around Israel, and I really hope that that nuance comes to the community. And I have to remind ourselves that like we are looking at this in a lens of months and this really is a decision and, and a movement and an evolution that happens over decades, right? We talk about generational change often when we deal with Jewish leadership and, you know, the movement to ordain women took many, many decades. And when you were living in it in the moment, in the early days of it, it felt totally schismatic. It felt totally problematic. It felt like the most important, most difficult issue. And outside of the Orthodox community, that's largely a solved issue when we don't think about it anymore. The same thing with accepting, you know, gays within the community. Or lady doctors. Or, I still don't know how sure, I feel about that. But. You don't really? <laughs> um, and, and let's, you know, recognize that this is part of the evolution and change of what goes on within a community. Are you in the market for a new watch or a special piece of jewelry? Are you looking for the perfect engagement ring to pop the question? Atelier Lou has all this and more. Eric and the team at Atelier Lou can craft a piece for you, or you can select from some of the exclusive designers that they offer. From a simple bangle to a statement necklace, Atelier Lou can make you or your loved ones sparkle. Located in the heart of Westmount in Montreal or online at atelierlou.com, visit Atelier Lou for your next watch or jewelry purchase. And when you do, make sure to use promo code BON18 for 10% off your next purchase. That's atelierlou.com. You were a pulpit rabbi for some time, right? A little bit, yeah. A little bit? Do you know how you would handle this moment or do you look for clear political messaging from a rabbi from the pulpit? Um, Is that something either you think you would do or that you would want to see in a rabbinic leader? Um, So, you know, I... And I'm, I'm less interested in telling people what to do than showing people the various sources and telling them this is what historically the spectrum of acceptable opinions has been. And this is my job to show you what's considered a wide, a widely accepted source, what's considered a minority source. And I'm, you're smart enough to be able to make the decision for yourself. So my job as a pulpit rabbi isn't necessarily to tell somebody what to think. 
It's often to tell somebody how to approach it, but the weight that I give on various sources does come from my denomination or from who I learned from. So I would want to, if I was coming at it from the pulpit, I would want to encourage people to go and say, recognize the complexity here. Don't think that you are the sole arbiter of what's acceptable and what's not. I'm not going to tell you what this is. I'm not going to espouse anti-Zionism. I'm not going to espouse uh, major extreme opinions from the pulpit. But I am going to say that there is a wider variety of acceptable opinions than you would otherwise think. If you were right now a pulpit rabbi, Mm -hmm. you know, giving sermons every week. I would would say something similar to that from the pulpit, yes. You you would say you would talk about Israel. You would talk about like we all heard about not. this hospital thing. We all heard about uh, you know X Y and Z. You, I think you you have to take a balance between. He wouldn't knowing, say Z because he'd be in America. <laughs> uh, I would totally always say Z. Uh, Z until I'm dead. That's my pulp. That's my motto. I, the balance is always. Talk about it without beating people over the head about it. Without while realizing that there are other things that you have to talk about. Um, within the community and help people along to get them to realize that the spectrum of opinions is wider than they would like. So I did have an experience like this where um, I was obviously not a pulpit rabbi. I was a kid um, and my Hebrew school, that was a reform Hebrew school um, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan had like, we went to lobby Congress and we had to espouse very left-wing positions, which my contrarian teenage self maybe had not all, not in full agreement. But the point is, whatever, none of this had to do, what what struck me about it was that none of this really had to do with Judaism, Jews, there was no, there's no one Jewish stance on certain issues. What's different here with Israel is that it has something very specific to do with um, Jews, right? Why like, it, Why is that different? I don't understand. Be- because it we, is. we, for a thousand years, had a very specific idea of, about homosexuality. We had a very specific idea but about I'm saying, women. So, We've so had very did, specific yes, ideas but, okay, for Avi, many, many if thousands I may of years, my and then thought, that changed. If, if a woman podcaster may, what I would say is that what's different is that Catholics have their thoughts about women and gay people. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, like abortion. Right, you know. exactly. Sure. Or whatever. And yeah, and, and, and um, different issue for Catholics than it is for Jews, whatever. But what I'm saying is that Israel is very specifically Jewish content, you know, a Jewish... Only, only in the past okay. hundred years as yes, a nationalist and it is. And it, But it is now. It is the Jewish state. And I think that it's just going to pose different... I think it's going to be more challenging is what I'm saying. And that it's not going to be as easily dealt with by, well, some congregations are more liberal, some are more conservative. You know what I mean? Does does this make any sense mm-hmm. what I'm saying? I, I, I do agree. I think it does touch Jews in a, I mean, it just descriptively, you see it like this is the congr- this is the conversation that breaks apart congregations that breaks apart Jewish families and friendships. It's not over, tends not to be over, you know, your stance on abortion or... or but know, it used to be. This, it could have been. It could be, but... It totally at this used mo- to be. We have to remember that congregations broke over whether okay, to desegregate so a sanctuary. What's your, what's, and, what's your and, point? And it broke families apart. But this is just yet another issue in the evolving question okay. of what it means to I be see. Jewish. I, I, guess, I guess where I have to disagree is I don't think it's yet another issue because I think these other issues are more solved by the same way as every other religion handles it where there are the more liberal and the more... And, and Judaism probably handles it particularly well in terms of having different... What I'm trying to say is that we're having the same conversation that we would have had in the 80s over... Right, over and, over I'm, gay, over and, I'm, and I'm saying that I don't think it's the same conversation. I also feel it's not the same because of the question of Jewish power. This is um, a situation where... Jewish people are in control of the public square and in control of who lives and dies and in ways that, you know, Jews aren't in control of abortion policy. They are in control of IDF military policy. Well, the only thing that I would say to that, Zach, is that most Zionists, like in the United States, certainly are not Jews, right? Like there's in terms of when you're talking about like Western pro-Israel you know, advocacy, but, a lot of this is like... I, there are so... But again, I'm sorry, Zach, but like there are so many issues that were in control purely of the Jew, within the Jewish world that have nothing to do with social policy or to have very little to do with social policy that Jews controlled that were totally problematic 
And for hundreds of years, this has always been the question, right? If you look at the the sanctuary, right? Do we have a machitza? Do we not? This was a huge issue. This was an issue that broke apart congregations for decades. The, the movement of Hasidism, whether Judaism is mystical or whether it's more rational, was something that broke apart Judaism 250 years ago. Right, this was huge. This was you don't realize how big it was, and that it was totally within but our we control. We didn't blow people up. That, that didn't. What do you mean? Like people that. were kill- People were totally violent about this. They weren't killing people. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to this Maimonides and book up. burnings. Let's go back to book burnings right. of Maimonides, which was totally schismatic. Basically, we were saying that this person is okay. a heretic. Yes. Okay. I, I think that maybe we're just arguing past each other because I guess all I'm I'm not saying that other things have not been contentious, but I'm saying that. I guess what I'm saying at like the bigger picture, the reason I say this isn't just to like argue about it, but because I'm trying to think about like how this will ultimately be resolved. And I think I I do wonder if the way it'll be resolved is if there's this kind of like Jews who observe Judaism and then there's like the Zionist Jews who observe Zionism and then there's a bunch of people who don't care. Does it at all track for you like in the same way that a lot of people at a reform or conservative congregation you don't really care whether someone keeps kosher or not doesn't keep kosher, whether they keep Shabbat or don't keep Shabbat. Will it be the case that I won't really care whether someone's Zionist or non-Zionist or a big Israel person? It's entirely not? possible. I, I'm not sure how it's going to shake down, but I think that we are definitely in the moment, right? If, if I had to compare it, I would say we are in the 70s with women and the rabbinate, and we feel like it's the biggest upheaval in the world, and it's going to shake out in some way or another. I'm not going to predict how it's going to shake out, but I think that in 10 years it'll or 20 years it'll be solved, but it's going to take a lot longer than just the weeks and months when this moment crystallized for us as saying, oh, there are Jews who aren't exactly Zionist anymore, okay, but what is or who okay. aren't exactly Zionist in the way that I believe in it. What I'm trying to figure out in terms of this analogy, though, is what is the analogy to being to allowing women rabbis, allowing gay marriage? What is the analogy? Is it is it welcoming anti-Zionists? Is it allowing Jews to not yeah. care about Israel? What is, yeah. what is or it? Or like, I don't care what the other person in the congregation, I don't care if someone keeps Shabbat. Or up. is it, or is it, but I, I guess what I'm saying is this is different from having an affirmative, like, we stand for fighting sexism, fighting homophobia, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, this is a different... I guess it could just depend on which congregation. Anyway. Yeah. I think it is something that's still very alive for, like, intermarriage. Like, this is something that mm-hmm. rabbinical schools also stand. But if you think they, about it 10 years they, ago, intermarriage was a non-starter. To. Nobody talked about it. You, if you tried to say it, you were basically the anti-Zionist of Judaism if you said that I, I perform intermarriages. I'll, and I, I think on that, congregations and rabbinical schools are also very reticent to draw a red line because, because they, they want, know that they can't. They can't. They don't want to alienate families. Exactly. They don't want to. And they're alienate. losing all these non-Jewish Zionists. Correct. I mean, they literally yeah. are. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, I think we should leave it at that. But I think that we, uh, you know, we'll we'll wait and see. Let's regroup in thirty years and uh, revisit this topic <laughs> and, and bring it up. Don't take half measures when it comes to home security. Alarms and cameras work, but they'll only tell you that your worst nightmare just came true. Safety Screen by Metalex for windows and doors will keep your family safe and sound with real stopping power. They can't be cut pride or bashed in so you can enjoy carefree ventilation in the spring and fall with peace of mind and protect your fixed windows and doors with rock glass an absolutely unbreakable clear covering call 416-638-2539 or visit metalexsecurity.com to book your free consultation that's m-e-t-a-l-e-x security.com remember prevention is always better than the cure all right nachas brigus what do we have this week Zach, do you have a nachas? Do you have a brigus? Uh, this week I have a nachas, and this one comes from a wonderful article I saw in the Times of Israel. Uh, and the title was, Two Paratroopers Can Claim Single Spot in Iconic Six-Day War Image. The article is about this historic picture of three soldiers from 1967, right after the Israelis captured East Jerusalem and are at the Western Wall. One is Chaim Oshri, one is Itzak Iftach, and the third soldier on the left was long claimed to be this guy, Tzion Karnsedi. And then uh, there was a fight. So Abraham Bornstein, who died, his family said, this famous picture, this guy, the guy on the left, is not who he says it is. So they threaten legal charges. They both filed defamation suits. 
against each other, yada yada, it was a big thing. So the interesting part is what the Tel Aviv court ruled last week, and I'm going to read it now. Both sides agree to put the argument behind them and transmit to the people of Israel a message of unity and reconciliation, in which the court will not be required to decide the question of who is photographed in the photo, while both sides will continue to believe in the truth they hold, wrote the Tel Aviv District Court Deputy President Benny Sagi. Attorneys for the Bornstein family said they, quote, applaud the poetic justice that leaves both options valid, existent, and possible. Sometimes this is the way to rule on historic decisions. So my mine, prediction I, is, is that we are going to have a schism in 10 years <laughs> within all of Judaism over who is in the picture. <laughs> who is in the picture. But I, uh, my nachis is for um, a people and for a society that can hold that one person in a picture can be two people. And so that is my nachis of the week. Awesome. Good one, Zach. Phoebe, what do you have for us? Well, that is going to be a very tough act to follow. Um, but my nachis of the week um, is this really uh intense i don't know if nachas it's it's not broigus but it's it's a interesting essay by the american jewish writer emily gould about nearly but not ultimately divorcing the russian-born american jewish novelist journalist and literary translator i'm on his wikipedia keith gessen brother of masha gessen anyway Emily Gould had some kind of like real breakdown and it, it was um, it, it's a, a bleak story, but really, really well told. She's a really, really strong writer. Um, and she wrote about this in the cut. Um, and people are very mad at her on the Internet for, I think, misguided reasons. I think they don't seem like I think with personal writing, sometimes people seem to confuse. Is this an interesting essay with is this person nice, you know, um, and I think there's a bit of that type of reading here. Uh, but yeah, it's a really interesting essay that I will probably have more thoughts on elsewhere. Avi, what have you got? Um, I have a double nachas, if you don't mind. Uh, the first is for a wonderful little essay in the Paris Review uh, by B.J. Novak entitled Caps for Sale. Um, I don't know if you've ever read Caps for Sale to a child or you were a child and you had Caps for Sale read to you, but it's basically a wonderful little essay about the nature of children's literature and um I liked it, um, but I liked it even more simply because one of the things that happened to me when I was in L.A. last week uh, was I went to the Kibitz Room, which is the little dive bar associated with Cantor's Deli um, on Fairfax Avenue in L.A., and who do I run into other than B.J. Novak, who happens to be a, like an actor and a writer. He was in The Office. Uh, he was Kelly Kapoor's on-again, off-again love interest. I don't know if that, uh, you know, rings a bell. He was famous, then he wasn't. Uh, he's a great writer. He's a great actor. Um, but I run into him and all I have a chance to talk to him about and all I get to talk to him about, not even knowing that he had written this essay a few weeks before, um, was about his book called The Book With No Pictures, which has given my family endless joy where all I talk about is this word that he shows up in the middle of a page in this book with no pictures says, that says boo-boo butt. And boo-boo butt has become a standard, you know, term of endearment right within the family um the final family uses boo boo butt for everything um and i told him about this and his face lit up because i'm sure that everybody wants to go up to him and talk to him about the office um and other you know cutesy funny writing pieces and i'm like no i want to talk to you about children's literature so that was um a great first nachas about la my other nachas is also about la um there's this eyewear company called Moscot Eyewear. They're exactly what you would imagine a typical hipster might be wearing. So I didn't know that they had a they had a full store in LA, and I walked in, and I was not aware of their naming conventions for their eyewear, and all of their models uh, of, of frames all have Yiddish names, and I was not aware of this, and I thought this was great, and I'm sitting there looking at all these frames, trying them on, telling the salesman what every word means, and like, so the the like they have frames called Schmendrick and Pitzel and Pupik and Gittel and Shetel and Spiel and Dre and Moyle, Hamish, and then I get to, of course, the Nachas. So okay. this is a meta Nachas for Moscot Eyewear and their Nachas frame. <laughs> 
Is it nice? Are the Nachas frames nice? The Nachas are like your typical 80s, like the wire rim, but oh. with the tortoise paint over it. So it's, okay. you know what I'm talking about? That yes, look, I do. That, that Ralph Lauren 80s okay. look of like... Very now, things. very now. Not necessarily for me, but I would totally <laughs> not refuse a pair if they offered me one and I would wear it regularly. So shout out to Moscot Eyewear. Send us frames because we love you all. Um, all right, and well, obviously you send a Nachas yes. frame or a Bruges frame. I don't think that they have a Bruges frame, but they should. Well, I... <laughs> I like Avi's, um, what's the word, pivot to influencer who gets sent um, accessories. I do I, not want the Tuchus frame. I do not <laughs> want the Moyle frame. Okay. I don't actually wear glasses, so I will have to, when I pivot to influencer, I will need... They have sunglasses. Um, okay, I'll, I'll... Zach, I see you in the Gotkus pair completely. Absolutely. <laughs> that is for you. <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time someone's told me they could see me in Gotkus, I'd be a rich man. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Bonjour Chai for the week ending February 17th, Shabbat Parashat Tiruma. The show is produced and edited by Zach Kaufman. The executive producer for CJN Podcasts is Michael Freeman. Our music is by SoCalled. We are a project of the Jewish Living Lab and are distributed by the CJN Podcast Network. You can listen to all our past episodes on our page at the cjn.ca slash bonjour, and you can subscribe to the podcast and automatically receive all episodes on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you told a friend about Bonjour Chai. It is one of the best ways we get new listeners. And as always, you can email us with comments at bonjour at thecjn.ca. 